last week on Off the Charts. What he did with that Rams offense is is something that I think is going to be a year-long type of thing. I think what he can do with a running game, what he can do with an offensive line, and what he can do with those weapons at receiver is, is going to be really special, I think, for uh, for L.A. And, and having a big run, um, you know, not only during the regular season, but also into the playoffs as well. I'm going to go with the Raiders. They go into Pittsburgh, which is a tough place to play. We've already talked about how good that defense is. But the way the Raiders played in the second half of that game against Baltimore, I think they have a shot to compete against uh, with a lot of different teams. I really wouldn't be shocked if Vegas comes out of there with another win. Hi, and welcome to the Off the Charts podcast for week three of the NFL season. I'm Mark Simon, joined by SIS VP of football, Matt Manicharian. What's up, Mark? And football rookie handbook co-author, John Todd. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Chiefs Ravens is great. Aaron Rodgers still has it. So do Legatron and Matt Prater. Got to give props to the kickers. Kyler Murray kept it going. So did Teddy Bridgewater. And the Titans got off the mat and avoided an 0-2 start by beating the Seahawks. Those are a few of the takeaways from week two. Matt, what was your biggest takeaway from week two? Ooh, well, I want to dive into some of that stuff you already mentioned there. But my biggest one is that the young quarterbacks are struggling for the most part. I think it's mostly they're in bad situations. You look at Trevor Lawrence. You look at Zach Wilson with the Jets, certainly right off the top of the list. Those first two guys, Trey Lance can't get on the field. Justin Fields didn't look great in the little bit that we saw. You could say Mac Jones has been the best of the rookies, but even he's just been kind of like what we kind of expected out of Mac Jones based on what what he was in college. So it's been a little struggle city, even the second year guys to an extent. Yeah, I thought Zach Wilson's performance was troubling. He was only pressured on one of his four interceptions that he threw, but it is still four interceptions. And the first two are put in decent spots. The last two were bad decisions, bad balls without being pressured, which is very concerning. Did say after the game he wasn't seeing ghosts, but who knows? NFL game moves faster on the front end, back end. So when you look at Zach Wilson at BYU in 2020, there's a lot of conversation about those runways that he was working behind with that great offensive line and how everything still looked easy. And then even when he was pressured, he had a nine to one touchdown interception ratio top 15 in the country in IQR. So you got to be concerned that maybe those first two picks he had gotten his head, maybe start seeing some of those ghosts later in the game and then led him to press a little bit towards the end of the game. You hope that doesn't damage his confidence. Yeah. In in one sense, it's been about as bad as it, as it could look. I mean, especially if you just look at the stat sheet for him in another sense, it's been kind of like, I'm not ready to write him off just quite yet. He was kind of bad at times in 2019 BYU 2020, the closest analogous thing I can think to it is like Reggie Bush, when he was in college and he would just get the whole offensive line moving seven yards down the field before he had to do anything. That was a little bit like what, what BYU's offense looked like last year. So the physical tools are there, but we have to see if he can do this in the actual context of like real football. Yeah. You really got the sense that he started pressing there towards the end, which is something that he, he could get away with in college and not so much now. And then on the other side of that game, Mac Jones is living up to, like you said, those kind of game manager expectations, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, he's doing exactly what they need from the win right now. Small sample sizes, of course, but his yards per attempt and average throw depth, they're way down from where they were in college, which is not crazy for a rookie. Obviously, uh, Alabama last year, you're chucking it all over the place, but he's taking care of the ball despite facing more pressure than he did at Alabama. And his catchable ball percentage is right now second in the NFL behind Kirk Cousins. So running the ball, checking it down, putting the ball where it needs to be, giving his team chances to win. It, what it makes me think of with Mac Jones is my old boss, Mike Lombardi, who obviously has close Belichick ties. He would always talk about figuring out how to not lose the game before you figure out how to win the game. Right now, it seems that Belichick's just asking Mac Jones to not lose the game, and he's been able to do that so far. Along with Zach Wilson, Joe Burrow threw uh, three picks on three throws. Any concerns there? You know, I'm, I'm all kinds of concerned about Cincinnati. We haven't really seen any direction out of them so far over the last couple of years. They decided to go with Jamar Chase in the draft, which I don't hate at all. You can't go wrong for me if you were choosing between Jamar Chase and Panay Sewell, but they certainly haven't done enough to address the offensive line. The only time the Bengals have been good over the last like 30 years is when they had a good offensive line. There doesn't really seem to be a plan up front there. You can't just have five guys out in every route, every play, and expect Joe Burrow to just be able to figure it out. So I, I got big concerns. And again, like these other guys, it's it's partially less about him and, and more about the situation. Meanwhile, John, your, your, your biggest takeaway from uh, week two. 
Yeah, I just think the Buccaneers are rolling again. It's just, I know it's the Falcons in week two, but we talked about the young QBs. You go back to old Tom, 40 plus now, unprecedented that they bring back everybody in free agency in the free agency era that's never happened before. It still feels like people just love to brush off the repeat possibility every year. It's more fun to pick new matchups for the Super Bowl. And then the Buccaneers come out and win a great game against the Cowboys and then just start rolling against the Falcons and look like they're supposed to. The pass defense has been a bit leaky, but they scored twice when they needed to, obviously. They made plays when they needed to. The run defense has been elite again. And Tom Brady just won't slow down for the nth year in a row, even without a, a dominant running game going right now they feel better than they were last year at this point, right? They feel like last year it was growing pains. We were questioning Brady and Arians this year. It's like Antonio Brown and Gronk are like looking like prime Antonio Brown and Gronk. It's like, wait a minute. How do we, how do we defend this? So I'm with you there, John. All right. We'll get back to the Buccaneers in a little bit. One other theme besides young quarterbacks that I want to touch on is injuries. And there were a ton of them to keep people in week two. TJ Watt, Bradley Chubb, Tua, Carson Wentz, status still unknown as we tape this. A number of others, Jarvis Landry, certainly among them. Derek Carr was, I believe, questionable for uh, this week's game. What injuries should we be most concerned about? For me, I, I mean, I, I'm very concerned at this point about Carson Wentz and Tua Tagovailoa. Both of these guys couldn't have more different guys, you know, from a, from a physical stature standpoint, right? Obviously, Carson Wentz is real big. And because of that, he tends to hold on to the ball, and that's been getting him into trouble. And two is real small. Put on weight in the offseason, you know, trying to do the Lamar Jackson thing, all that kind of stuff, bulking up. But he really is having trouble staying healthy back there. And his offensive line certainly didn't didn't do him any any favors. He's got the broken rib now uh, as a result of it. And if you watch, you know, if you look into that game, either on the stat sheet, just the number of blown blocks that the Dolphins had, they could not block the Bills at all. Um, Or if you were just watching just anecdotally, it it looked like there was no offensive line out there for the Dolphins. So I don't know if Jacoby Brissett's going to be able to do anything in the meantime there, but really big concerns, like big picture about can Tua stay healthy? Like there's already, we're not sure how good he is. We were watching a little scout school film last night and a little Tua popped up on there just from an example play that we had. And it was like, man, this guy was an athletic looking college quarterback who's doing interesting things with his arm. And that's not the guy that that we've seen on film in the last year plus. And now there's the concern on top of it, which is really, really legitimately, can this guy stay available? Because he's not very big. And then it's really similar, even though totally different situation, totally different way that we got there with the near MVP year and then falling off. But Carson Wentz holding onto the ball too long again and finding his way onto the injured list. So really, really big questions for both of those guys in terms of both availability and ability. Yeah. Tua back in college. I remember watching him in college and and the main thing that always kept coming into my head was that quick trigger of his hips. That's the main thing that you always saw with him like that innate athletic ability, but the quickness in his lower half and his upper half and, and the, the twitch that he had in his throwing motion and stuff. And that feels like it's been gone. But like you said, I mean, he got hurt. Brissett came in and the pressures didn't stop there. So that offensive line really needs to to get fixed up. I was going to make a note on, on Jarvis Landry. I think he's a pretty underrated sneaky loss for the Browns moving forward the next few weeks. Hopefully it's not too long. It sounds like it might be more short term, but Odell Beckham always gets the headlines, whether he is or isn't playing. Obviously the the whole conversation about how their offense performs without him last year and everything. And he's obviously the more dynamic player, but no Brown has run more routes since Jarvis Landry got to the Browns in 2018. Uh, No one has more catches and maybe most importantly, nobody has more yards after the catch. He's been as durable and reliable as a safety net as you can have around the league. And the Browns do have some downfield playmakers that can make up for some of the stuff downfield that Odell can do, but it remains to be seen who can step up in that short to intermediate range that, that Jarvis fills for them underneath. I like that. We get the macro view with Tua. We get the micro view, something that's more short term with Jarvis Landry, certainly concerns in both areas. All right. And then before we segue to week three, a couple other things. One, the taunting penalties were a big story in weeks one and two. Penalties overall, Rick Gosselin sent out a tweet, number of penalties in weeks one and two way up. Sean, what's your takeaway from that? Yeah, anybody who was watching the Cowboys Chargers game was just a mess with penalties, especially on the Chargers side. But that just dictated the game, right or wrong. Some good, some bad calls, obviously, but it just kind of every play there was a stoppage. The Thursday night game had some too, which was the main game that I was watching as a Washington football team fan. The hold on the Daniel Jones touchdown was bizarre to me that they just wiped away. And one that nobody's really talking about is there's a totally egregious call on a McKissick run for a first down where he fell over and, and wasn't touched. They reviewed it. Nobody was remotely close to him. They did a full review. 
and still said that they upheld it. And I mean, that was one where Mike Pereira on the broadcast was saying, I have no idea what's going on here. And when he's not defending the referees, you know, it's a bad call. So there's just been some crazy stuff going on, obviously in college too. There's always stuff, but yeah, it seems like it's, it's been more pervasive this season for whatever reason. So the refs could be better than they've shown. Can you give me a team or a player that's better than what they've shown so far? Yeah, quick note on Chase Young. He hasn't done too much in the pressure department this year, but still extremely talented, has not looked like there's any issues with him running. He's looked fine. It's getting chipped a ton. Teams are starting to scheme against him more. Played well in run defense. I personally think the stats keepers cheated him out of a half sack on Thursday night. He also beat Andrew Thomas for another sack, and Kendall Fuller beat him for a, a corner blitz off the off the edge for a sack. So the ability is still there, no doubt. Montez Sweat has sacks in five straight games going back to last year, which is the longest active streak in the league. John Allen's got three sacks already this year. So Chase's lack of production isn't necessarily a, a product of the, the group, the position group as a whole, but they have gone quiet for longer stretches than they should for being such a avant defense. And he's definitely overdue for a splash player three. That's the player, Matt. What about teams? Yeah, from a team perspective, I would definitely say that the Colts and the Vikings are the best 0-2 teams by a long shot. Some of the 0-2 teams you look at and you're like, okay, we kind of get what they are. It's not happening this year, what we expected. These two, I think, are teams where it should be in panic mode right now, both of them. You obviously don't want to be 0-3, although who knows what that actually means on a 17-game season. But I think that these two teams are, are absolutely much better than their records show right now. Each team could easily be 1-1, one and one, no doubt about it. And then you look at, like, I always like to look at the passing leaderboard to understand how teams are how teams are actually moving the ball through the air. The Vikings are actually eighth in passing points earned so far this year. So that gives me just some extra reason to believe, you know, things are going to be okay in terms of the results playing out better than than the way that they have so far. If the Vikings make the playoffs, what's the scenario by which they get there? If they make the playoffs, it's a lot of Dalvin Cook. It's a lot of play action passing. It's a lot of who the Vikings have been over the past few years when they've been good. They've got to do something to get the pass defense under control because that's been a weird thing that's happened to Mike Zimmer's teams over the past couple of years. That's the the beginning and the end of it from a from a defensive perspective. And what about the Colts? For the Colts to get there with with Wentz out, and it looks like I think he's out this week, and it's Jacob Eason. It looks like, you know, certainly it would help if Jacob Eason, you know, came in and, and showed a lot of confidence. <laughs> John, I don't remember how well you remember him coming out. I remember we watched him and we saw all kinds of arm talent. I think he had a pitching background too. You could see the physical tools there to be able to to do everything, including including place the ball accurately. But he really had trouble uh, diagnosing coverages, and and there was a lot of development that he needed in terms of that. So he's been in that system for a while. Nobody better than Frank Reich. You know how I feel about him, but we've got to see if if that can actually show on the football field. That's a tough ask on the NFL level. And there's talk of a practice squad quarterback actually playing this week too. Forget who it is, but so we'll see how that turns out. But yeah, Easton's been there for a while. And for the Viking side of things, you got the good version of Kirk Cousins this past week. And couldn't get the win. So you're not going to get the good version of Kirk Cousins every week. So got to maximize those opportunities. Oh, wow, John, you're right. I hadn't heard that. I, I see the report that you're talking about that Brett Hundley was taking more of the, the starter reps than Jacob Eason. So not a great sign for Eason's development not, there. Not what I expected. Yeah. All right. We're ready to get talking on week three and we'll start with Bucks Rams. Tampa put up 48 on the Falcons last week. Tom Brady, five touchdowns, no interceptions, but a little unsatisfied. I think the intrigue here is the Rams, 2-0. Matthew Stafford's look good. They beat Brady and the Bucks last year with Jared Goff. They're definitely stepping up in quarterback class from their first two games. Give me some scenarios by which the Rams pull off the upset. Is there something that we can take from either of these teams that would make you think that they have a shot? Matt? Yeah, the scenario is easy for me. Like it, it starts with, with Tom Brady. He's been absolutely unbelievable. We mentioned before the receivers and how they're playing and the group that they have. But one thing, you know, the 48 points, part of that is they had two pick sixes against the Falcons. So it makes that 48 seem like the offense played like outrageously well when they played well. And from an EPA perspective, that bears itself out. Uh, the key to beating the Brady is always going to be getting pressure on him. Pressure up the middle is the best way to get pressure on most quarterbacks. Aaron Donald is, and, and the pass rush unit as a whole, straight up for me, that's the key. That's where the game starts and ends for, for the Rams. If they're going to win the game, it has to be through that avenue. All right. And John, the Rams offensive line against the Bucks defensive line, where's the advantage there? 
yeah, obviously, like Matt said, the, the interior is going to have to work hard against Sue and then vice versa with Donald on the inside. That's that's the easiest way to win in the NFL is interior pressure. But I'm just in general a huge believer in this Rams team. I think McVay has been waiting to have a quarterback like Stafford his entire career, which is crazy to say, like he's been coaching a long time. He's he's barely older than I am. But now that he has him, the passing game has just exploded. So much of their tight split zone-based play action offense has opened up with Stafford's arm strength where previously they were having to work so horizontal all the time with Goff and, and rolling left and right and keeping things underneath and, and moving things laterally split zones and stuff like that. And now they're able to work ver- vertically down the field, which is something new for them. Stafford's opened up all those options for them. So uh, I think McVay's having a blast at that. We mentioned the Bucks struggles in pass defense already. I think McVay and this offense are going to put that group to the test this week. And Matt, the other thing that we should watch with Matthew Stafford in this offense is Cooper cup, right? Yeah, I mean, it's been it's been the Cooper Cup show all over the place. First of all, Stafford, amongst quarterbacks with at least 50 attempts this year, he's leading in points earned per play, 37 points earned per 100 plays so far this year. So he's been outrageously good, and it's the marriage of the scheme and the talent here that John is talking about that makes it so beautiful. It's this scheme that hid a lot of Jared Goff's deficiencies. Jared Goff's not a terrible player. Uh, we've seen him have a little bit of success in uh, Detroit so far, but being able to take his physical skill set, kick the best out of that, marrying it with, like John said, the wide zone, the tight splits, all of that kind of stuff. Now, all of a sudden, Matthew Stafford's in there pulling the strings, and it's been really pretty so far. And Cooper Cup has been the main beneficiary. It seems like everywhere you look, he's getting the ball. He's already been a great fit in everything that McVay wants to do. And now it seems like they made it to the Super Bowl a couple of years ago with, with that quarterback. The sky's the limit right now. So when you're watching the game, keep your eye on Cooper Cup because he's going to continue to be that target until somebody finds a way to stop him. All right, let's say way to the Sunday night game. 49ers, Packers, one of the marquee matchups of the week. Aaron Rodgers, much better week two against the Lions. Jalen Hurts was able to run against the 49ers, but they contained his passing much better than the Falcons did in week one. Nick Bosa was huge against the Eagles. Can he and his teammates disrupt Aaron Rodgers enough to hang in in this one? Matt. My big takeaway from watching Aaron Rodgers after the first two weeks of the season is obviously week one was really bad, but week two to me wasn't, wasn't so great. It wasn't like I thought he played vintage Aaron Rodgers football. Certainly you look at the stat line, you saw four touchdowns and zero interceptions pop up during the fourth quarter of the game. And I'm thinking, wow, is that the same guy I watched today? Cause it felt like he missed Valdez Scantling at least like three times when he, when he was open for potential big plays. And sure enough, when, when we looked at the total points, and how the actual stats actually played out. You see a solid game, but not, not a game that, that absolutely jumps off in terms of, in, of the, the points earned. Seven points earned for the game. That's a solid, a solid performance there. But at the end of the day, I'm still concerned that Aaron Rodgers isn't quite himself right now, it, it, which is a weird place to be because I'm usually like this Aaron, Aaron Rodgers apologist. I remember two years ago when we had him at the top of the, the total points rankings, people saying, but, but he stunk this year. What are you talking about? And sure enough, he went, you know, and had the MVP season. But through the first two weeks now, he's missed some. I mean, there was the ridiculous touchdown pass to Tanya in the end zone was one of the best throws of the week. But he's missed enough where he wouldn't miss in the past. His ball placement specifically just really hasn't been there. And I'm I'm waiting for it to maybe it's just the lack of a real preseason and and the offseason and the way things went there. But it, it hasn't it hasn't looked totally right yet. So if you want to talk about how you could disrupt Rodgers, it's, it's, yeah, if he doesn't, if he doesn't get to the point where he's himself, maybe it's Bakhtiari not playing that's, that plays a part in that and the comfort that comes with that. But I, I do have concerns. I definitely agree that week one, Aaron Rodgers was definitely not himself. There were a lot of timing issues with him. He had guys running wide open for checkdowns and, and things that he just wasn't seeing in time that didn't result in first downs when they should have easy plays that he normally hits. But I thought this past week he was a little bit better. I thought it was interesting. I don't know, Matt, have you watched any of the, the Manning broadcasts that they've doing, the commentary that they've done? Exclusively. I'm loving the Manning Yeah, broadcast. I've enjoyed it too. It's, uh, I think the, the guests can overshadow a little bit of the commentary, but when they talk scheme, it's been awesome. And I loved how they were talking on Monday night. They were breaking down Rogers' patience on Monday night with the Lions playing too high all the time, just taking what they gave him with running it to Aaron Jones. 
Then the second they rolled into that one high and he got Adams on that perfect deep ball, that was just dropped in the bucket. The next play was the Tunyon touchdown or a couple of plays later. So I think he still has plenty of that spark there whenever he needs it. I think there's more concern on the other side of the ball with the Packers pass rush has had some issues this year and going up against the 49ers offense and Trent Williams, who's playing at the top of his game, who's been just elite left tackle for years now. Those guys need to get it going if they're going to have any chance against the 49ers and, and what they do offensively. Going back to San Francisco, the NFC West off to a great start. Can the entire NFC West somehow make the postseason? I think it's really doubtful. The way it's the mathematically is- hard. I get it. Yeah, it's, it'd be really hard. Do I think that all those teams are good teams? Absolutely. But it's, it's, uh, it's a lot easier for a 7-9 and nine team to make the playoffs like the Washington football team last year, or I guess 7-10 and 10 is the case maybe now, than it is for four teams to make it out of the same division. You all have to play each other, and generally there's other teams that are going to sneak into those wild card spots, and the tiebreaker system really doesn't help as, at all because then if you're tied with anybody in your division, you eliminate each other before you get to any multi-team tiebreakers. A lot of reasons why I get I get the question, but I just think that it's doubtful. Mathematically here, it's difficult, but and I know we're we're an analytics company and everything, but just strictly speaking from the teams involved here, to play devil's advocate, I do think if any division could do it, it'd be this one. The fact they have to beat up on each other for six games, the math of it and everything, that's the difficult part. But I right now trust all four teams in this division more than maybe any of the second best teams in the other divisions. If you run through it, the East is probably just going to get one team. The North, maybe only the Vikings are going to contend behind Green Bay. And I think there's a good t- case for each of the West teams over the Saints and Panthers behind the Buccaneers. So not saying it's going to happen, certainly, but when maybe you've got the Seahawks currently the shakiest of the of the teams in the West in the, in the division, that says a lot about the strength of that group. Is the NFC West definitely better than the AFC West? Yeah, the, strictly the, NFC speaking. Yeah, the, the Chiefs and Chargers tied for third and fourth place in the AFC West right now. Chiefs and Chargers are pretty good. We got the undefeated Raiders and Broncos, too. I know that they've outperformed expectations so far, but I'm just saying. Yeah. AFC was speaking, strictly speaking, NFC. So what would it be to do it? It would be like three 11 and sixes and a 10 and seven. I don't think it's happening, Mark. I really got to be honest with you. Well, I'm outside the division. The extra game. The extra game is a non-division game. So it does. uh, It does add a little bit more of that, that sort of possibility. I, I figured just for fun that that would be worth bringing up. So yeah, that's, like I said, I'm not worried about the math of it. I know that's the, the difficult part. Just the four teams are pretty good. That's that's what I'm seeing so far. Right. Well, all right. I think I think all four going nine and eight or better is probably like that's that's reasonable. Right. right? And okay. I think the odds have those as, as the numbers too over unders there. So All right. Eagles Cowboys Monday night. Uh, we just referenced Jalen Hurts. Eagles got a little out of their passing game in week two. Cowboys got a field goal of triple zeros to win. Dak had a gaudy completion percentage, but unimpressive in passing points earned in week two. Tony Pollard had a huge game. Jerry Jones is talking about a two-back offense. John, what's going to determine who wins this game between the Cowboys and the Eagles? I think the two big things in this game are the Cowboys defense needs to contain Jalen Hurts in the running game, in his running game. Make him beat you with his arm downfield. He's already got nine first downs this season with his legs alone, and he's only 29th in the league in air yards. So he has taken some shots downfield. His intended air yards are up there middle of the pack, but he hasn't been completing those. So you need to defend those and make him hit those shots if he's going to beat you. But they really need to defend him in the run game, make sure he's not getting wide open scrambles for first downs. I saw that all the time against the 49ers. And then Dak Prescott needs to put up numbers against an Eagles pass defense that hasn't given up a 200-yard passing game yet this season, surprisingly. And and they have they blew out the, the Falcons, and that was in garbage time with a, a decent Falcons offensive passing unit. So Eagles pass defense has played decently well. Uh, they haven't played the, the – obviously, the 49ers are running the ball a lot, but Dak Prescott's been putting up a lot of numbers his past five, six games, healthy games going back to last year. So they're going to need him to show up and, and carry them to this win. Are we sure? Are we sure the Falcons have a good passing unit. Yeah, uh, I don't know. So far this year, they're gonna be playing from behind the, a lot. Ahead of the Jaguars, Jets, Titans, and Bears in passing, the you know the great passing teams in the league. Uh, <laughs> Ouch! Shot fired. No, but no. Um, for me, this game, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think Jalen Hurts is a nice fantasy quarterback. I don't think he's a great reality quarterback. I'm, I did, he's still got to prove to me that he can be accurate enough to really get that done. Sorry to be that guy. So for me, who determines this game? The Cowboys determine this game. The Cowboys offense determines this game. If Dak Prescott can score more points than the Eagles can put up, then the Eagles can't win. So really for me, the game comes down to the the Cowboys. And the only way they lose this game, I think, is if they beat themselves. 
But if they find a way to shoot themselves in the foot, turn the ball over, have some sort of horrible game management that, that gets them into trouble. But really, for me, I think the Cowboys are, are the class of the NFC East. I've said it before the season started, and, and I'm going to keep saying it. To me, there's the, the only way they lose this game is if, is if they really screw it up. John, I know that uh, you have some thoughts on the NFC East, particularly the Washington football team. Can the Washington football team challenge the Dallas football team? Let me talk about my football team real quick. So the (laughs) the Heineke factor has been fun. Taylor Heineke, I'm really not too concerned about his ability to keep the season afloat for a while. He'll win you some. He'll keep you in it with some flashy plays, run around a bit, and make you scratch your head with decision-making off-target throws. Sounds a lot like Fitzpatrick, doesn't it? I mean, I don't think the offense is going to lose too much of a beat with with him at, at quarterback, but always an injury risk himself with his history and his play style. I think this past week I, I heard someone say it was the first time that he's completed a full game in the NFL that he didn't mm-hmm. injured in at some point. So so we'll see about that moving forward now that he's a full-time starter. But I'm much more concerned with the play of this heralded defense. They can't get off the field on third downs. As we talked about earlier, the pass rush has gone quiet for long stretches. Or when it does turn it on, the back end can't limit separation. So they haven't been in sync on that end a lot. And this linebacking group's been disappointing for a unit that's led by Ron Rivera and Jack Del Rio as like premier linebacker centric coaches. So the Giants definitely gifted them that game on Thursday. Uh, they got a really tough stretch coming up, starting with the Bills on Sunday. They're playing a first place schedule this year. So I fully expect the record to not look great at the halfway point. Uh, especially if this defense can't turn up against these elite quarterbacks they got to be facing. But they got a bizarre scheduling quirk with the last five straight games of the year against division opponents. So no matter how they look going into it, they're going to be in the hunt in December. John, you mentioned that matchup between Washington and Buffalo coming up. And I would say, despite the fact that Buffalo won 35 nothing last week, they haven't really been happy with how they played either, especially on the offensive side of the ball. It's been disappointing for Josh Allen to start. We didn't know coming into the year if it was going to be 2020 Josh Allen or if it was going to be the, the Josh Allen that we saw before that. And so far this year, Taylor Heineke's 20th in passing points earned. Josh Allen's 23rd in passing points earned. It has not been a good start to the year for somebody that climbed into what, what Mark? He's in our top five in the, in the quarterback ranking list, right? Yep. So I think you got two teams there that when you talk about the units, the Bills offensive unit feeling frustrated against the Washington defensive unit feeling frustrated. I'm really curious to see how that matchup of two units that we thought were really good plays out. I know if, if Aaron were here, he'd be talking about, you know, offense is more consistent year over year than defense. We should expect this sort of regression with Washington's defense. It's really hard to maintain that play year over year, but you can counter that and say, okay, explain the bills to me so far. That's, that's a matchup that I'm really looking forward to in terms of something's got to give. So some takeaways from the early part of the show. Be excited about Matthew Stafford, for one thing. Vikings look a lot better than they've shown so far. We've got uh, Aaron Rodgers. We've got mixed opinions, I think would be the best way to describe how the two of you kind of went back and forth on that one. And the Cowboys will determine who wins on Monday night by how well they play. All right, we get set to go to break here. We'll have stats and scouts in a second. I want to do one thing as we go to break. I want to talk about the SIS Data Hub. It's our premier tool for looking notes up, looking stats up. Matt, what was the coolest thing you found on the Data Hub this year so far? I mean, the coolest thing that's that's on the Data Hub this year is the tenancy report section. There's a whole new section of, of the Data Hub. You can pull it up, select any team you want, and you can understand kind of who this team is. So I just pulled up the Washington football team seeing who they are in terms of what personnel groupings they like to use. They've been absolutely awful out of 12 personnel so far this year, ranking 31st in the league, seeing how well they like to make use of shotgun and motion. They're ranked fifth in both of those categories this year in terms of their usage of them, despite the fact that they're middling in terms of how good they've been in those situations. So you can start to get just all of these different tendencies, both offensively and defensively to really understand how teams are deploying themselves. And I've loved watching how that's developed over the first two weeks of the year. So we've got the Data Hub and the Data Hub Pro. Matt's talking about the Data Hub Pro. That's a little more robust. It's pay version available for both college and pro. There's a free one as well. You can certainly check out if you're looking for some basic things, like how does this player compare to that player? It's pretty good for that. So go to sisdatahub.com, poke around, and see what you can find. To close the show, we do another round of scouts and stats. John Todd, give us the scouts take on one player you're most excited to watch in week three. 
I'm going to go with Chandler Jones, the Cardinals. I think he's got a recipe for a big week going up against the Jaguars tandem tackles of Cam Robinson and John Taylor, who last year were number one and number three for SIS and total blown blocks. Jones was unblockable week one against Taylor Lewan and then his replacement after that, racking up five sacks. But he was much quieter last week against the Vikings, so we'll see if if that's more the, the schematic trend moving forward or if he can revert back to week one. But he tore his bicep in week five of last year, but in his last fully healthy season in 2019, he was second in the NFL with 19 sacks. And then obviously coming back week one this year with five, obviously give everybody hope that he's got that ability back. He's just so tough to handle with that ridiculous length and closing speed, his unorthodox rushing style. So we'll see if he can keep adding to that sack tally against a pretty favorable matchup on paper. And give us the scouts take on the team that you're most excited to watch this week. Yeah, I'll go with a matchup of the two teams of the Saints and Patriots facing off. I think this is a good measuring stick game for both teams. Despite his five touchdowns, I thought the Saints were pretty conservative with their scheme for Jameis in week one. And then last week, the Panthers did a really good job playing keep away from him, which is what the Saints did the Packers week one. So they got to taste their own medicine there. And then Jameis and the whole offense came crashing back down last week. So now they've got to face a Belichick defense that always takes advantage of quarterback weaknesses. And they're a team that's found their identity of being a ground and pound ball control offense. We talked about Mac Jones earlier, managing games behind Damian Harris and their running game. They've, they've got their, that identity going there to kind of keep going with that keep away mentality that the Panthers did last week. So I saw their Patriots are favored by three, the low total points. I think there's a good combination for a Patriots win, unless you get quote unquote, good Jameis showing up, which you never know with the, the Jameis experience. Well, I was going to ask which QB after three weeks in the season, will you say is the better quarterback Mac Jones or Jameis Winston? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting for what he's doing for his team right now. You'd probably say Mac Jones, like I said, I think they they kind of handled Jameis, even though he had five touchdowns statistically. I think they handled him a bit with kid gloves in week one. With It just ended up working out with him getting five touchdowns. Offensive line's protected great and everything, but Mac's playing pretty well right now. And if he keeps staying under the radar as a quarterback, which you don't see too much, with their formula, the rest of their team that they have going on, I think that's a, a pretty good combination. I would say that the price is right for both of those guys. They're both on very friendly contracts, one rookie deal and one very under under market value deal for, for Jameis Winston. So with all the talk right now, NBA, Ben Simmons talking about holding out, this dude's getting $40 million a year to not shoot the ball on the basketball court. Opposite situation there. These guys are not overpaid and underdelivering. They, they, their asset value is off the charts, I think, both of them. All right, so Chandler Jones, Saints Patriots. Matt, your thoughts. First of all, which player excites you the most for week three? I mean, the player that excites me the most is back to his pre-injury form. It's Cortland Sutton. This guy's outrageously good, and he's jobbing with my boy Teddy H2O against the soft early season schedule. Now, I got to warn you, this is only going to continue one more week. The schedule gets significantly tougher for the Broncos, and I think that we might see a bit of a regression to the mean. But so far this year, Teddy in the top five in passing points earned. Cortland Sutton, seventh in the NFL with six receiving points earned. He's got 2.7 yards per route run, just doing outstanding work so far this year. So look out for him. He's back. They're home against the Jets, who haven't been terrible on defense, but they faced the relatively conservative Patriots and Panthers in the first two weeks. I'm probably setting Cortland Sutton up for a dub, but I, I love this player. From a statistical standpoint, I think we can see him look to explode. All right. And which team do you like in uh, week three? I think the most fun matchups this week are Chargers Chiefs and Bucks Rams. Those should be really fun. But the team that I'm most excited for, if I didn't give it away before, is the Cowboys against the Eagles. You've got one of these, you know, we talked about like what with Washington and Buffalo before, one of these offense defense matchups. The Cowboys are 10th in passing points earned against the Eagles, who are 10th in pass defense points earned. On the other side, the Eagles are 21st in passing points earned, and the Cowboys are 22nd in pass defense points earned. Like I said before, Hertz is a fantasy QB. Dak is the real thing. I'm going to take the team that can pass the ball themselves over the team that, that's been better defending the past. If I've got to figure out who I think is going to win going forward, offense over defense, really like the, the Cowboys in that one. All right. This wraps up the Off the Charts football podcast for week three. You can find our content all over the internet. Our Twitter is sportsinfo underscore SIS. Our articles looking at matchups and prop bet possibilities are on sharp football analysis. For stats, check out sisdatahub.com. We've got lots more good content coming, so keep your eyes peeled for that. For Matt Manicharian, John Todd, and our producer Justin Stein, I'm Mark Simon. Thank you for listening to the Off the Charts football podcast. 